am a success. I'm a business systems analyst. I'm a professionally trained makeup artist, but I'm also a proud author of four published books. These are not the only reasons that make me a success. I'm a narratives changer, I'm a tribe builder, I am love, and I'm a storyteller. Now, you're probably sitting there wondering why am I telling you these things? Some of you perhaps even judge me. Who says that? How obnoxious. But I am a success, in case you didn't hear me the first time. And I'm here to share my story that you'll probably find intriguing. I grew up in Lusaka, Zambia. Let's just call it society or culture. And that society that I grew up in said to me, the steps to success are go to school, get an education, graduate and get a job, get promoted, get married, have babies, have more babies, build your dream house, and then you'll live happily ever after. That was the formula, right? A to-do list that society gave to me to check off every time I accomplished one task, and then I moved on to the next one. When society said, go to school, that I did. I learned how to read, write, and speak. And fortunately, the school that I went to wasn't equipped to teach me about child abuse. So I did what culture does, and to sweep that under the carpet and remain silent about it. Like some of you, this is just one example of the many things I've had to deal with as a girl growing up in this society. When society said, get a job, I applied for a job, but there was society rejecting every job application, telling me I'm underqualified or overqualified or not qualified at all. Get promoted, society even dared me. But the same society mocked me, a woman in IT management. I remember sitting in a job interview once with 11 men on an interview panel, and one of them said to me, now tell me, which husband would allow his wife to leave their marital bed in the wee hours of the morning to save the world? Somewhere between getting married and having babies, my life came to a sudden halt. It was a Saturday afternoon. I went to bed about 1 p.m. because I felt extremely tired and I had this relentless headache for weeks. I slept throughout that afternoon and throughout the night until the next morning when my alarm clock woke me up at 7 a.m. I lay in bed awake but I couldn't move. I couldn't wiggle my fingers. I couldn't wiggle my toes. There was no movement coming from my body. After about an hour or so, I managed to get movement in my body again, and I went to the hospital. I was admitted, and the doctors diagnosed me for scanty malaria. But what they couldn't figure out was why my temperature spiked to 39 degrees every 3 p.m. and 3 a.m. of each day. A week later, I was discharged and sent home. And the following day, I remember sitting in a room and watching through a window as my sister's kitchen party event took place. I couldn't stand or sit for long periods of time, so I was unable to attend the celebrations. At 3 p.m., my temperature spiked again. But this time, there was, there was something different. I felt like I was going to die, so I quickly rushed to the hospital. Upon arrival, the male nurse took my temperature, which read 41.2 degrees. That's like 0 0.8 degrees from being declared brain dead. So here I lay now, in a hospital bed, with tubes attached to my body, and an oxygen mask to aid my breathing. The doctors said all my organs were failing, and all my senses had escaped me except for one, hearing. And no matter how much the doctors tried to whisper, 
I heard them say to my family, we have done all we can. There's a 50-50 chance that she'll make it. Imagine lying in a hospital bed, uncertain of tomorrow, because the doctors couldn't find out what was wrong. And tomorrow turned into more days, and these days turned into more weeks. I no longer felt like this once confident woman, because I couldn't meet society's expectations of me. My life had come to a sudden halt and I felt robbed of my job title, my finances, business had halted. I had nothing more to show for my achievements. All these questions began to bubble through my head. Hospital beds do that to you. And I asked myself, despite society's expectations, who are you? What defines you? What do you believe? And why do you believe the things that you believe? What is your truth? What was my truth? All I knew was what society expected of me, and that was the definition of success. And as more weeks went by, the doctors gave me more cocktails of medication. I had to learn how to walk again, but I was in so much pain if I have to describe the pain that I was feeling, for any of you that have experienced a toothache or slid a disc or even tore an Achilles tendon, any pain associated with nerve pain. Now, add to that the feeling of walking on hot coals, needles and pins, your muscle pulling at the same time, a sharp pain, all bundled up in this one ball of pain, constant, over an undefined period of time. That is the sort of pain I experienced when I had to learn how to walk. But step by step each day, I took a few more steps than the previous day. I began to realize that as long as I walked a few more steps each day than I did yesterday, then that was a success. Learning how to walk was exhausting, so when I felt tired and I fell asleep, that pain instantly shook me, and I stayed awake at night. And I realized that despite my setback, I could do something about it. That's when I began to write my books. I wanted to be the voice of those suffering in silence. Besides, this experience wasn't something I wanted to remain silent about. And as I continued to learn how to walk, I decided this time, I didn't just want to walk through life, but I just wanted to fly. And so when I began to apply for jobs, I wanted to push myself beyond the boundaries that I'd set for myself in my own limiting mind. I realized that sometimes, you have to take the jobs you don't want to eventually get to the jobs that you deserve. And sometimes those jobs that you absolutely hate, those are the jobs that count, because they'll teach you the best skills to last you all of your career and even lifetime. After a year of recovery, I discovered my own version of success, and that was to be authentically me. And in being authentic, I learned the value of self-care. Self-care meant to me listening to a word of encouragement, reciting positive affirmations, I can, I will, I'm doing, speaking to a support group that I felt safe with and I trusted seeking a professional to help me through my unresolved traumas, exercising and resting and dancing like no one's watching. Because when that music of life suddenly holds, who knows, dance you will no more. Eventually, the doctors found out what was wrong with me. I ate raw fish that had bad bacteria, and at the time, I was the 16th case reported worldwide. 
So you see, I am a success. I chose to deconstruct society's expectations of me and discover who I was meant to be the moment I was born, and then allow myself to write my own story of success in a positive way that inspires others to do the same. And you can too. You can throw that list away with all its expectations and timelines. Because we're not just human beings, but we're humans still becoming. And I think what that means is there is no one formula, there is no one to-do list. Every single one of us is as unique as a fingerprint and cannot be boxed, but should be allowed to write our own stories of success. I have my definition of success. What is yours? I am a success, are you? I leave you with a quote by Annie Sweeney, a former president of Disney, and she says, define success on your own terms, achieve it by your own rules, and build a life that you are proud to live. Thank you. Thank you.